Yeah, I'm Barry Hankin, um, and I'll be co-presenting with Phil um, shortly. Um, I've been head of environmental modelling for about a decade at JBA, and um, this has been one of the um, sort of big uh, national scale models uh, that I've helped develop. It's a rainfall runoff and water quality model, and it was um, devised to try and evaluate and assess the whole catchment pollution risks and the reduction in those um, possible from the catchment sensitive farming program, which we'll hear a bit more about. As well as Phil, um, who's the evidence manager at the Environment Agency for CSF, we've, um, we've also um, a lot of other uh, contributors have worked on this. So Linda Pope and Chris Burgess and Tom Newton at the Environment Agency, Ewan Strumquist from SMHI and Lotta, um, along with Sarah Warren and Nicola Wood. So it's been a, a big three or four year um, model in the making. Um, it, it's taken quite a while. It was some of the evidence um, from it was used in the most recent CSF evaluation report. Um, so uh, it's got quite a lot of data behind it and there's quite a lot of details to sort of um, introduce you to. Um, I'll just move on to the next slide. So yeah, we'll have a, an introduction from Phil shortly, and then I'll um, go into some of the technical details for um, hydrologists in relation to um, HYPE and the adapted version of it that um, we co-produced with SMHI and the Environment Agency. We'll talk a bit about how we've um, adapted the model uh, and, and, and sort of adapted it to the needs of the Environment Agency all the data processing, the flow and water quality calibration, uh, how we've improved that, where we've had base flow dominated catchments in, say, on the chalks, and also how we can use the model um, to look at climate change scenarios, uh, in addition to evaluating the effectiveness of CSF. And then how we can also use it with um, sort of business needs, such as understanding uh, water quality source apportionment for new bathing waters like the one um, on the wharf uh, and so on. So, um, so first off, I'd like to introduce Phil. Um, as I say, he's the evidence manager uh, in the ARE uh, section uh, of the Environment Agency and uh, I'll forward it on to his first slide. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, Ellen. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, before I start on mine, I, I'd also like to stress that this has been a really effective three-way partnership between the Environment Agency, JBA, and SMHI. So I think that's grown over the years and has proved to be really fruitful. So I'm really grateful to acknowledge everyone's input to this um, project. So I'm going to keep my bit brief and an overview before we get into the technical detail. But Catching sensitive farming, um, the CSF bit of CSF hype. Um, it's a farm advice program. It was launched back in 2005. Um, it's funded by DEFRA, delivered um, on the farm by Natural England and supported by the Environment Agency. And that Environment Agency role is really around evidence, making sure the CSF officers who've got the farm drive have the evidence they need to get farmers to take action and it's around evaluation. So what are the impacts of that scheme on the environment? So the key elements of CSF, it, it's focused on face-to-face -face CSF officer delivery. So it's farmers, um, direct engagement of farmers. Um, but those CSF officers also have access to specialist private sector advice. So if detailed conversations are needed around particular areas on farm, they have that resource to draw on. Um, it's also about ensuring that all those delivering advice in local catchments. There's some coordination across that and some consistency of messaging to farmers. Importantly, it's about facilitating agri-environment schemes. So it's giving farmers access to grants to fund improvements and agreements. And really importantly, for, for me at least, CSF is very much evidence-led. It's targeted, it's evaluated based on sound evidence. So, CSF started back in 2005. It was um, initiated as early action to help address um, water framework directive, water quality issues. Um, it's expanded significantly since then, and it continues to expand. Um, it's now going to be in a 15 million a year program. 
and that expansion now is to water quality, air quality, and natural flood management advice um, across the whole, or pretty much the whole of England. Can I have the next slide, please, Barry. Thank you. So our evaluation of CSF, um, it's a really great program because evaluation was built in and resourced right from the very beginning, um, which is quite unusual. Uh, but the purpose of that really threefold, I guess. Firstly, um, to provide management information so that those running the program know that CSF's on track to deliver. It's about continuous improvement, learning from doing, making sure that our experiences um, of the program and its effectiveness uh, feed back into the program to improve the design and delivery. And really importantly, it's always been funded on short term cycles. So our evaluations are absolutely critical um, to encourage DEFRA to reinvest in CSF. And as I've outlined, they've been quite successful in that regard. So our approach to evaluation, um, we take a weight of evidence approach because of the challenges of linking farm advice directly through to environmental improvement. So the sort of things we look at are the scope and scale of engagement with the farming community, um, whether those farmers we engage become more aware of pollution and support available to them, whether their attitudes to those issues change. We record the uptake of measures on farms. What are they actually doing to mitigate pollution? We then use models to estimate how much less pollution is leaving the farm as a result of those measures that are put in place. Then the CSF hype model comes in to say, well, how does that translate into water quality improvement? We also have a significant water quality monitoring program that runs alongside the modeling to assess its benefits as well. We also have an ecological monitoring program in River to assess the eco ecological response. And we also look at this more broadly from a natural capital ecosystem services angle to uh, understand the wider benefits of the program, as many of the measures that we put in place for water quality have wider benefits. So this evaluation is reported on a regular basis um, and the links there on the slide if you'd like to see our latest evaluation. So that's hopefully gives you a bit of uh, scene setting. I'm now gonna hand over to Barry to talk the technical stuff. Thanks, Barry. Thanks very much, Phil, and thanks for that excellent introduction. Um, I'll, I'll try and go into the uh, technical aspects of CSF hype, which we've seen as is just one aspect of, of gathering evidence for the effectiveness of CSF. Um, so a bit of background for those of you who may not have used it. So HYPE stands for Hydrological Predictions for the Environment. And it's an open source model. So it's something where the code is available. We could go and access it and, and look exactly how it works. Um, it's semi-distributed in that we have um, sort of a representation of um, sub-basins or um, water bodies. Uh, it's about that scale, but within that we have different hydrological response units or soil land classes, which can behave in different ways. And although they don't pass water between uh, those um, subunits, uh, they all contribute to the um, stream flow. Um, it's unsteady um, in that so the other national scale model, SIMCAT, is the steady state statistical model. HYPE is the process-driven, um, process-based model, uh, which is driven by uh, rainfall um, and temperature data on a daily basis. Um, and it, it, it can also sim simulate the water quality from nutrients um, and, and a number of other determinants. So as I say, it's driven, driven by um, daily precipitation temperature data, so more of that shortly. Um, it does simulate the water flow and substances through from precipitation through the soils, uh, through the river network and the lakes to a river outlet. And it does simulate the daily runoff from different soil layers within those hydrological response units, which um, uh, make a mosaic. Um, of different soil types and land um, uses. And um, we've um, sort of taken this model and created a, a new adapted version of HYPE called CSF HYPE for England, because it is different to the original HYPE. Um, the intention being that we could bring in some more of the information uh, that had been learned on the sort of pathway impacts 
um, for the different um, locations of uh, farm diffuse pollution uh, in the land phase and how that is um, transported and, 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 and um, processed in the, in the land phase of the HYPE model. HYPE has a large um, sort of community of users. It's got a, an excellent um, wiki of its own where it's quite easy to look up um, different um, aspects, uh, all the equations and details of the parameters that are used um, and the different assumptions in that. So it's quite, it's a nice model to work with um, and we've worked closely with SMHI notably New and Strongfist to develop it. So um, it undertakes, in, in the soil layers, it undertakes a water balance computations for three soil layers. Um, and in agricultural soils, you can add drainage, um, which um, can also take place through tile drains. So we did um, bring together um, the soil data that we had, soil association um, and soil texture maps. But we also had access to um, where soil is drained and, and information on the depth of the tile drainage. And that has all been built into um, what we've developed. Um, so we've used the available data to sort of improve um, the information that's been used by the model. So of course that influences the rates of runoff from the different soil layers. Um, other flow paths such as the surface runoff and erosion are modelled and the water outflows from each hydrological response unit are added together and routed through first of all a local river network um, and then through the more explicitly modelled um, larger main watercourse network which is based on the water framework directive um, layer of, of, of main watercourses um, and then also um, we can have various uh, water bodies that are influenced, so we can have inline and offline um, lakes and reservoirs, and those have been added as we'll see. And in each of those stages, the different water quality determinants are processed, so there might be nutrient cycling, or there might be uh, sedimentation or resuspension, and those processes are all modelled with the process rates and so on being explained in the uh, high wiki. Um, now, so this is a, a slide of what's happening with regards to the nutrient cycle in the original hype. In CSF hype, um, those um, nutrient pools and cycling and application of fertilizer and so on is all sort of tacit to the um, excess nutrient concentration loads, which are applied to the um, uh, land phase. So we take out the complexity of of, of those um, processes and we add um, the diffuse inputs based on the catchment change matrix. Um, this is a, a database um, based at the sort of farm holding level which has um, which provides outputs from the environment agency on uh, the diffuse loads for nitrates, phosphorus and so on. Um, so how did we modify the way the model worked for CSF hype? If you can imagine the three um, yellow units here, these are hydrological response units which have been classified because they've got particular soil types and land cover. And the runoff response to different rainfall, to the same rainfall will be different um, in those different units. That's why they've been classified differently. Um, but from other work, um, uh, what we wanted to do was to introduce some um, explicit representation of how um, diffuse sources act also act like point sources. So depending on where they are in the landscape, they would have a different travel time to the watercourse network. So we introduced uh, an, an additional classification um, based on time of travel. And that was based on um, knowledge of the topography, um, knowledge of the uh, land cover and assumptions about uh, roughness and so on. And, and so then we were able to divide uh, those initial hydrological response units into finer um, classes and, and then uh, develop a, a, a more sort of um, uh, specific application of hype. 
I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that shortly. Uh, in terms of the rainfall and temperature, hype is driven by the daily time stack rainfall and temperature data from HAD UK now. Originally, it was UK CP09, but that's been updated. Uh, you can find some more information on that grid um, at the link. And um, what we've tried to do here is um, drive the model with the best available present day scenario uh, data. And so what we've done is taken the five kilometer grid of those time series for the, um, from about 1990 actually to 2020, um, because height needs a warm up period uh, as with a lot of rainfall runoff models. So we have a seven year warm up period. Uh, and then those tiled uh, time series, daily time series, are then um, intersected with the 5,000 odd sub basins. And so we have a, a, a sub basin appropriate rainfall. As we update that year on year, we try to sort of check that the data sets are sensible. So here's one that Sarah's produced um, using Trelliscope in R. And, and essentially, you can see that as we added uh, the most recent year of data from HAD UK, it makes sense. And, and we can spot any outliers or, or strange behavior before we then put it into the model. Because one of the things we've realized is that there is so much data in the model that we really need to sort of check the inputs, check the outputs as well, and check what processes are doing. Um, and to do that, we've had to develop a range of tools, including the ones that are supplied by SMHI. So how did we make the sub-basins and, and, and how and what processing did we need there? So in the end, um, it wasn't good enough just to take the water flow metrograde water bodies. We had to clip these to a slightly smaller scale because we'd realized that where you have a flow gauge uh, in the kind of um, high quality NRFA um, flow gauges, um, we uh, wanted to have that gauge at the outlet so that the calibration would be more reliable. Uh, that involved quite a lot of splitting and chopping and GIS. So this was quite a major sort of uh, analysis just to split those water bodies further so that we'd then get more reliable calibration. Um, we also um, took into account the connectivity of the main river network, and there's some various bits of software that help you do that so you know which basin flows into which other and so on. We then had to bring in all of the um, effluent flows, abstractions into each basin. So there's an awful lot, actually, there's probably more than 40,000 sources that have been incorporated, um, I, and, and mainly as monthly load time series. And where we've got data, so where it's quantified uh, in the WINS database, uh, which holds the, the water quality data, um, we, we'll have used that. But where there aren't, there isn't data, but we know about the consent for the discharge, that will have some assumed um, default uh, water quality. Um, this year, we've in included the, the septic tank data, um, which is essentially um, applied to land with some inputs to the um, different soil layers. And we've also included intermittent discharges now. So CSOs, which have been in the news a lot, are now included as well. Um, based on the sort of consents and, and default um, loads. The sort of best available abstraction data is included. So we've got all, most of the inputs and outputs into these catchments. So not only are we um, bringing in these point source loads, but we're also bringing in uh, the diffuse loads, which I mentioned earlier. So um, those are based, as I said earlier, um, on the catchment change matrix, which also drives things like the data behind farms data. For late processing, I won't go into a lot of detail, but essentially we had to, again, change uh, the makeup of the water body so that, for instance, a lake was wholly within uh, one of the sub-basins. And where they are very influential, uh, they're included as what's called an O-lake, and that can influence the um, attenuation and so on at the output. And each of these might have a, a water level 
um, and they're, they're sort of calibrated to give you the, the, the right um, level of attenuation at the, at the flow gauge. So setting up the hydrological response units was a bit of an, a GIS exercise again. Um, we had the three, uh, the, the five um, soil textures, include, which included chalk. So we, we, we split up the national classification based on those. Um, we used 14 land cover bands um, over on the right. And then we also devised five time of travel bands, um, which don't influence the hydrology. They're there to influence the um, pollution, the, the rate of decay of pollution. Uh, depending on where it's input into the landscape. So that um, leaves you with five times five times 14 um, in, uh, unique combinations. Uh, obviously, some of those results in quite small um, HRUs, that, so there aren't very many uh, combinations of chalk with a certain land use type. Um, so for instance, so if they're smaller than a certain percentage, um, then they're not used as a, an individual HRU. So we've got these, um, they're all combined to the five soil types, 49 covers, and five time of travel horizons into 234 significantly sized units. So these are then said to have the same similar responses. So you can see each subcatchment is made up of a mosaic of those different HRUs. And then it's our job to try and calibrate the individual classes um, based on a, a sort of process of calibration which focuses on small catchments which are primarily built up from one type of class and then getting a, a reasonable um, fit there with the parameters and then rolling that out nationally so that wherever that class occurs it responds in the same way and it's quite a successful approach. Um, each sub-basin is divided into those HRUs and they, they share the common runoff characteristics, like I've said, and they all have these three soil layers um, and they respond differently to rainfall and antecedent conditions. The diffuse loads, as I said, are applied more in a, in a more simplistic way. So these are the um, excess loads um, that are applied onto the land um, and they're apportioned into the different runoff fractions um, based on the, on the relative flow um, within them. In terms of the pre-processing, um, as I said, we had to devise various scripts. So um, now um, Sarah has um, used the R NFRA package and we can download the latest data from the RNF at National River Flow Archive for those 777 sites and grab the data we need for 20 years or 30 years of data, and it takes about five minutes. And then we write R scripts, so we use R a lot to generate the time series, look for gaps in the data, look at the flow duration curves, look for um, reliable gauging stations where we think they should be used in the calibration of the model. So that was a big exercise that was done once and then it's kind of refined yearly. For the water quality uh, data pre-processing that and that all goes into the model as well. We use the um, large water quality database called WIMS. Um, we have to make various assumptions about the limited detection and how to handle qualifiers where the lab reports of value less than or greater than a certain concentration. And then, We've written our scripts to generate the kind of plot you can see on the right, so we can understand for each of the different determinants, phosphorus, nitrogen, fetal indicator organisms, and suspended sediments, um, what's been happening over the um, uh, period of interest, have there been stack changes, and so on. Now, um, in, in sort of uh, other national models like SimCat, we would have to explicitly try and represent this period after the step change. But because this is a, a daily time step in hype, we can simulate and try and, sit, um, and uh, look at the through time behavior as well. Um, so that's a little bit about the processing. I obviously haven't got time to go into this, but the gray boxes 
um, are all the different data sets used in the preparation. So you can see the HAG UK data, consents, the WIMS database, um, the Whiskey database, the lakes data, the soils data, the land cover data, and the digital terrain model. And those all get used in different ways that I've started introducing to generate the inputs in orange to um, hype, which are all tax files, so they're quite easy to interact with. So um, for instance, we have the precipitation observation data and the temperature observation data as just text files, which are long time series that are driving the model. So they're quite easy to, to look at and, and process. So those all go in a, a level of pre-processing. And to give you an understanding of, of that, this is just one small uh, part of the preparation of the data to create the monthly time series of point source inputs. Obviously you can't read all of that, but there's a lot of data that's assimilated, uh, the quantified data, the quali qualitative data, and so on, and how we fill in gaps and um, make assumptions, for instance, when we don't have certain uh, data. So um, you can see that there's an awful lot of data behind it, which has been categorized and, 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 and is held um, centrally. <clears throat> in terms of flow calibration, so once we've got that big model uh, and all those data inputs loaded, um, how do we then improve that? So um, what, what the first stage is to sort of understand the sort of water balance uh, once we've got things um, working. Um, and we use the sort of multi-step process um, for the different flow gauges. So as I said, the calibration strategy for flow includes first isolating small catchments comprising a high proportion of key soil land, class, uh, land use classes. So what you might do is sort of um, with a process of filtering on a spreadsheet uh, that might result in looking at 20 small catchments, if you're lucky, uh, which are 60% medium grain soil, soil um, perhaps with arable. And then what we would then do is adjust the parameters and the key sensitive ones are in the table, uh, which include things like field capacity. Um, and then um, either manually or using auto calibration routines, which are built into HYPE, um, we get a better fit. And then once we've got performance improved and we're happy we've done that uh, within a sensible parameter range, uh, then we roll it out nationally. There's a range of tools that can be used at the national scale. Um, I like um, the HYPE web um, one here, where you first off give it a bit of um, information on the geodata the locations of the sites. And then you can simply drag in the results file onto the web page and it will give you different performance statistics for each of the sub basins. That's what the dots are on the map. You can also, um, you also get a report in a text file, which gives you various measures which you can choose. So the regional mass suckliff efficiency, which you might be familiar with, involves stacking all of the time series data uh, for the flows on end. Um, and then uh, looking at um, uh, the the uh, the national health efficiency measure for 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 that entire series, and you can see here we've got a value of 0.89. That doesn't necessarily mean it's working well everywhere. And in fact, you can see there in this initial attempt that some of the purple areas um, produced on the right hand plot, which is produced in R. Um, is uh, essentially poor performance on the chalks. So there were some um, areas which were where the calibration wasn't so good, but actually nationally it wasn't bad. You can zoom into some of those time series and plot them with more R routines. Um, so you can look at how the time series compare at one of the key gauges. And you can look at that seasonally and look at the individual performance in terms of KGE or NSE. That's obviously a good one that I've picked out. Um, but you can also, um, once we've got a, a decent flow balance, and, and that's really essential in these kind of um, water quality models, um, before we start making assumptions about water quality, which is even less well monitored, um, we can then go on to trying to do a similar 
calibration process for the water quality determinants. Um, so having a, attained that reasonable calibration, we can then sort of uh, adjust the other uh, parameters which control things like the half-life or the decay rates of different pollutants in, in the environment. Um, so, you know, we start again looking at a mass balance and then uh, look at these different things such as uh, retention rates, um, perhaps the, uh, the volume of dead zones in the water courses, um, perhaps the half-life of the sort of decay rate of different pollutants. And then you can see the kind of output that we can get. And I think some of these plots, if I just zoom in on, on, on some of them, you can see the dots of the sampling um, uh, sampled um, water quality determinants. And you can see that they're quite often a lot more noisy. Here we've got much larger sampling error because obviously um, they're only taken every month and probably not taken during high flows. Um, but you can see the kind of um, fits that can be attained um, for the different determinants that we're modeling, which are nitrate, phosphorus, suspended sediments, and fecal, fecal indicator organisms. Uh, which are E. coli in this instance. So then we can also use the HypeWeb um, calibration tool to look at how the water quality is performing across um, uh, England. Um, yeah, I should say that the, 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 the model covers and is set up for England, although it does have a few Welsh catchments modelled and the um, assumed inputs from uh, Welsh water quality and, and, and river flows um, on the seven, especially. Um, but you can see here, now we're looking at relative error in the mean. There's no longer any point in looking at measures um, like Nash Sutcliffe. We're simply not going to get a good um, uh, performance based on that. So we look at basic measures such as correlation coefficient and relative error in the mean. And you can see what how the performance you can you can basically click on one of these points um, and you can see an outlier up here and and that would highlight where it is on the map and then you can start investigating well why is it not doing so well up there and try and improve it and you can also look at where is it important you know the larger catchments um, what's nitrogen doing um, where we're looking at you know catchments which are predominantly arable um, so you can uh, take out and filter um, various sub-basins based, um, based on just um, filtering in a spreadsheet and look at the, um, adjust what you put into the HypeWeb viewer and you can look at the performance. So nitrogen, nitrate generally, um, the model is doing pretty well. For phosphorus, we still um, get a bit of an over-prediction um, and you can see that um, the performance is quite variable um, and it's under prediction and over prediction in places. These are slightly older plots, which are from um, last year's calibration. So as we go forward, we'll be improving those. Um, and, and this can be down to uh, understanding how different processes such as macrophyte uptake of phosphorus are represented and, and how well they calibrate. Um, in terms of um, trying to understand um, uh, the, the uh, success or the evaluate the catchment sensitive farming program, um, what we did is before and after approach using CSF hype. So we used what you've seen there as the calibration with um, inputs to the land phase based on no catchment sensitive farming and then based on um, the improvements that. that that we think have been made through catchment sensor farming and then looked at the impacts on the water quality. So here you're looking at the percentage change in those catchments. And you can see that obviously the catchment sensitive farming program has these priority catchments which are marked in blue on that uh, map that I just flashed up. So it's these areas where we're seeing the most improvement. And those changes, it's quite hard to understand how well they perform uh, how well the model is performing. But essentially, you can see here through time what's happening year on year in the top 100 catchments are where we've got the biggest change due to catchments and so farming. Um, and those sort of 
projections of an improvement of up to sort of 20%. So a reduction in uh, diffuse pollution this, uh, um, in, in, in this instance, suspended sediment, you can see up to about 20% with quite a lot of variability. And that was the kind of the order of um, projected load reductions um, based in earlier reports and um, before the end of the CSF programme. So CSF height at that sort of national scale, looking at the changes is kind of where we're expecting. Um, you obviously have to go into a lot more detail to understand that. Um, and you can look at individual um, sub-basins that are subject to CSF and then look at what's happened through time. So you can focus in on, you know, here I focused in on a site where things are looking quite good. Um, and you can see the total phosphorus um, reducing through time. And that might largely be because of a change to sewage treatment works, but it might also be due to a change in CSF. Uh, so a change to the diffuse loads. And, you know, the task is quite often to separate those and understand the evidence for um, which, which of those is contributing the most. But here, at least, we've got a framework where you can and look at it in a sort of through time um, basis. You can see on the right um, here, we're looking at fetal indicator organisms, and the E. coli here is just um, so noisy um, that this is a high frequency site on the wire in the northwest. Um, it's high frequency episodic and quite often driven by, you know, storms and so on. So we're always going to have uncertainty in the input boundary conditions. So it's quite a difficult thing to model. And, it, and OK, we've got a, a daily time step now. Perhaps what we really would need is some sort of translation of, of that to uh, an hourly time step um, so that it was more compatible with the events causing the pollution. Um, so that's kind of like a work in progress with, yeah, we could look at the, you know, kind of mean um, improvements to um, this type of water quality improvement, but actually on a day-to-day -day basis, it's going to be highly uncertain. So having, uh, I say I've got about 20 minutes left, so that should be okay. I'll, I'll try and go a bit faster, but I just wanted to cover some of the other sort of hydrological uh, improvements we've made. Um, so one of the issues was with the base load dominated catchment, so on the chalk and where we've got some large aquifers, where, um, uh, the model wasn't performing quite so well as you saw in that map of model performance. So how did we go about improving those? So um, th this is a diagram that Ewan came up with essentially where um, what we can do is introduce aquifers um, which connect uh, by um, the, the water surface um, uh, water bodies together, uh, but subterraneanly. So we can um, have inputs from different um, sub-basins, uh, so a recharge from those into this large aquifer groundwater store. Um, but obviously, uh, Hype can model that simplistically, and it can and it can actually sort of also provide emergence. So how much of that water um, from the aquifer is then returned to each of the sub basins? Um, so it's a it's quite a simple model, but it allows a sort of linkage of surface water bodies um, via um, the aquifers. So what we did is we took this um, Wangatel paper. And Ewan um, overlaid for the significant aquifers across England um, the different soil types. So here we've overlaid um, chalk. And you can see that um, in terms of the sort of major aquifer here on the Thames, we've got quite a lot of chalk overlaying that. So the idea was, was, was then we could um, ex look at um, this map from Mangatel and define the most significant aquifers and then try and include those as stores uh, within the model so that we could get this groundwater influence and so that we could then improve the calibration of the, the gauges within those um, sub-basins. So in grey, you can see all of the 5,000 odd sub-basins and you can see the ones that are then overlaying on the different aquifers that we then went on to model. 
um, to try and remove the spikiness in some of the uh, height projections compared to the observations. Um, so our initial idea was to um, overlay these with um, the BFI host, the base flow index, so um, to um, try and improve how the return fraction from each from the aquifers that we put in place, so from those groundwater stores, uh, how, what proportion of it should go back into each of the subbasins. And we base that ratio on the base flow index. Um, and that were, actually, that was quite a successful strategy. So we were able to first off improve the Thames, as you can see there, and then go on to the other subbasins. And you can see that if I flick between the before and after, uh, essentially what happened was all of those red dots, that, or brown dots, that are, and you can see the Ingupta efficiency going um, from brown to green. So, um, so that was undertaken by SMHI and they focused on um, uh, a new uh, measure, um, which essentially was the um, relative error in the standard deviation. Um, so reducing that because of the spikiness that we see in the model predictions here. So you can see there, um, this is a subcatchment which you've zoomed into and you can see um, the before and after. You can see that the height predictions in red are better aligned with the data, but it's not always um, you know, um, perfect. So here on the Lamborn and I think also on the Pang, you can get that kind of um, behavior approximately better, but then the sort of exact um, uh, daily changes are, are not always captured. But for a, for a national scale water quality model, we've got things a lot better. And also from having introduced those um, six or seven aquifers, we can then look at, at uh, some, some time was spent trying to calibrate the levels based on borehole data. Um, and then we can look at not only the level in those, um, but also the water quality. So we can look at, uh, here we've got inorganic nitrogen and we can see how the levels of those of that has increased from 1990 up to 2013. So it's not been taken any further, but you could see how a, a simple store representation um, with the correct kind of um, volumes um, of, of water and the inputs based on the hype uh, could help you understand roughly what's happening uh, through time with the um, uh, concentrations of nutrient. So that's um, another aspect I wanted to cover. Um, then I just wanted to show you two examples. Uh, I probably haven't got time to go into them in a lot of detail, so I'll flick through quite quickly. The climate change and then a bit on source apportionment because I said I'd cover that. Um, so one thing that we've done um, is also driven the model using UKCP18 data, the RCP8.5 um, uh, ensemble projections for two epochs. Um, and we've um, used that, again, aggregated those um, gridded inputs over our subbasins for height. And um, because we can't just simply take those um, UKCP um, 18 time series and use them straight into the model. Um, what we've had to do is generate uplift um, factors. So these are based on uh, looking at the difference between UKCP 18 for a, a kind of present day period, so 2000, uh, 2020, and then comparing and what's predicted on a monthly basis with the 2020 to 2040 or with 2060 to 2080 and creating uplifts that are based internally consistently on the, on the Met Office data. And then we apply those uplifts to the HAD UK data. And then we, we give it the same amount of warm up that we've used for our present day scenarios. And then we look at uh, what the model is saying for those future epochs across the different ensembles. Um, now, uh, there were, we did that once, um, and then the Met Office have issued uh, a correction to the time series. 
So we've now we're in the process of updating it. So some of the outputs that I'm showing you will need to be updated because of that frozen precipitation correction. Um, so let's have a look at some of these. So here, um, what you can see is some heat maps. Um, we've got the normalized rainfall uplift for ensemble one uh, uh, compared with uh, 20, the 2020 to 2040 compared with 20, 2000 to 2020. And you can see um, you know, in red where we get um, some, some larger uplifts. Um, the scale is ranging from minus 150 to 150 percent there. And we did the same for temperature and we, we can look at those and we can look at them across uh, all the ensembles for the different future epochs. So the question then is, well, how do we assimilate all that and make sense of it all? Well, um, before I show you some plots of how we've done that, to try and look at the kind of interquartile range of project across the different ensembles for each epoch. Um, what we've recently done is look, before we go on to that, we've just updated and looked at how the uplift factors have changed between the Met Office corrected um, and the previous incarnation. And you can see there are some quite significant changes there. So the upper one is to do with rainfall and how our uplift factors changed and then the lower one is to do with temperature and how they've changed. So you can see some significant changes there, which we're going to then have to reprocess. Um, so the first way we started making sense of, of, of the changes is to look at the median of the mean uplift across all the ensembles for each epoch. So for 2020 to 2040, the central uh, heat map here is showing you the median across um, 12, I think it's 12 ensembles of the projections from UK CP18. And then the upper one is the uh, lower quartile and the lower heat map is the 75th percentile. So um, essentially you can see that's one way of looking at it. So because we've got this vast uncertainty, we start trying to rationalize it and look at the median and the interquartile range. And then we can do the same thing for um, water quality because it's hype and it's trying to um, predict those. What we then also have to do is um, make assumptions about the future um, load inputs. So here what we've done is essentially frozen in time what catch and sensitive farming uh, inputs of uh, diffuse agricultural loads and the same for point sources. So you might want to change that in the future and, and look at more ambitious CSF um, inputs, uh, reductions. Um, but here we've just simply frozen them as they were in 2020. Um, and um, in addition to these kind of heat map looks, we can, uh, we can also look at the um, flow duration curves. And you can see, uh, I've just plotted a few here, and then also there's, some, uh, there's a, a GIF which is showing you how those change as you move around the country in different sub-basins. And you can see quite often that for small flows on the right of the plots, um, with those, those across all ensembles that are predicted to be smaller. And for um, very high flows to the left of the plots, we're quite often predicting to be um, larger, although you can't quite see on those. Um, and obviously this is in the area of extremes. So it, it, it's more uncertain still. Um, we can do the same for con concentration. So we can look at concentration duration curves. And I can see how those change. And perhaps sometimes there's some surprising results as well. This is just one random catchment. And you can see how the concentration can change across those ensembles um, as well um, in relation to present day. So it's quite a powerful amount of data that we can, we can look at. And finally, um, uh, this, this script um, written in R, again, you can look at, so Nicola wrote this one, where you could look at the time series now against the observations, and then also the time series from UKCP18 in that catchment for flow and for a determinant. And you can also look at how the monthly statistics are changing. So what you'd hope to do with this is answer questions like, 
well, can we make, you know, can future catchment interventions help us be more resilient against the impacts of climate change? That's the kind of question that you could answer with these types of plot. And you can see there's some more here for a smaller catchment. Those are for flow on the left and then concentration for soluble phosphorus on the right. Um, and then finally, because uh, we've only got five minutes left, um, I just wanted to show some outputs from the source of washment module, because we can also look at how much of the decayed load um, re reaching a point of interest, or there's a typo there, um, come, has come from each sub-basin. So, you know, recently there's been quite a lot of high profile information on combined sewer overflows. These are the intermittent discharges we've now included and we can ass assess their relative contribution at a point of impact. And this is one for the Yarm catchment. And so you can see there in pink, pink part of the pies, that's the contribution from CSOs. Um, and in the more rural areas, you won't get any. Uh, as you come into the sort of more urbanized areas, you can see how they contribute to the load alongside the diffuse loads and also the point source loads. So it's quite a powerful, piece of software. Um, obviously, you have to then look back at how well calibration works in this catchment and before you trust it too far. So in summary, so there is a new national and study process-based height model, which I've tried to introduce you to uh, for England. It incorporates point and distributed diffuse pollution load time series. Um, it's got new functionality to help represent the pathway impacts a little bit better by including uh, a travel time. It encompasses those four determinants which we've covered um, and it's driven by HAD UK data and, and basically you can see the performance there, it's there for everyone to see. Um, the modelled water quality with and without 10 years of CSF programme agrees with kind of other estimates based on other models and also observations. So we're kind of gaining trust that it's, it, it's a reasonable representation at this kind of whole country scale. Um, and it's also been used to look at future scenarios. There's a bit of work in trying to understand what all that information be, uh, means um, because there's this sort of competing influences of um, increased dilution because of more flow, um, but also less it, say, for instance, in the summer, um, less overland, faster flow pathways, so um, less chance for um, the sort of uh, faster, uh, more concentrated flows reaching a point of in impact. So there's, there's quite a lot to unravel there, and uh, we think we've made a good start. Um, and also, we can now look at apportioning um, where the pollution is coming from in terms of you know, where is important at a point of interest, having taken into account in-stream processing of the different pollutants. So I know that's been a real whiz through, and we've only got about three minutes left of your lunch. Um, there's a, a reference list there, but there's also my email. Um, so obviously there could be quite a lot of questions about hype, CSF hype, um, and we can't really field them all now. But if you want to email me with any questions, um, I'll try and get back to you. So I'll stop sharing. Um, Thanks it. very much, Barry. Um, maybe if you just leave that up so people can see your uh, email address for any questions. <laughs> um, yeah, so thank you very much, Barry and uh, Phil, for presenting today. Um, yeah, we don't have much time left for questions, but I have got one that from Ian Reid, who uh, asked this quite early on into your presentation. Um, so. Ian is asking, does hype account for one variable soil flow pass, including seasonally variable importance of crack flow in heavy soils, and two, the menace of plough pan and plough later interflow, both might lead to greater speed of catchment reduction and solute transport? Um, okay, so can flow pathways change seasonally? Well, they can in that there will be, you know, a greater proportion going different um, um, via different runoff pathways. Um, but it's not something that we, we, we're changing 
um, explicitly. Um, and then in terms of those other in, um, interventions that you mentioned, partly those may be represented in the actual uh, diffuse loads that are put onto the landscape. Um, so if they count as a sort of CSF measure, then there may be a proportional um, change in the load that is applied and then routed through the land phase and, and water phases. Um, now, if, if it's not, you could then potentially uh, alter some of the um, uh, HRUs that where, where you're interested in. So it, it just depends, you know, at, at a national scale like this, um, perhaps it's something that might be better represented through a change to the inputs, like in my first point. 